So yeah, so um, everybody can see this here, and uh, I'm monitoring the chat for uh, for our friends here who are online. If there's any technical details that you're not uh, clear about with that, uh, just feel free to comment, and I'll see if I can manage from that. Uh, I want to thank everybody for showing up to this. This book has been a lot of work for me, and it's been a long time coming. Um, the title is perhaps a spot pretentious, you know, as the science of uh, as the science of measurement. But uh, it's a it's an important goal for me because the goal for me is to hi, uh, the goal for me is to try to find or demarcate a space uh, for social data science in a field or in a world where the the word data science or you know. Um, uh, can mean a whole series of different things to different people. Some of them are very dull. Some of them involve, say, how do I make a dashboard? Or how do I go to a blog post and use a machine learning algorithm? And I think we can do better than that. Uh, we started a social data science program here about five years ago at this, uh, at this department that was partially on the back of a need, a need to address the vast amount of data coming in. And we uh, were kind of learning as we went along and the world evolved around us. Uh, this book is an attempt in order to consolidate uh, simply the first course, <laughs> if you will, uh, for that social data science program, but also in order to make it as a statement. I, what I really didn't want for this book is it to be a textbook, uh, or rather a, a just documentation writ, writ large. Uh, the book shouldn't be simply the same thing where you could go online, find the documentation, here's a series of statistical routines, or here's a series of um, ways you can visualize data. It's a, it's a scatter plot, it's a bar chart, but rather I wanted to find a way to think through the use of data. So the book itself has a kind of a narrative to it. Uh, I'm going to introduce that narrative and walk through it. Hopefully that'll be not too dry and maybe a bit illuminating and we can get through it in around half an hour or so and I would love thereafter in order to uh, take any questions uh, either about the book itself or broadly speaking about uh, social data science if I can. Uh, not everyone is um, in or adheres to a, a notion of social data science. That doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm not here to be fussy about disciplinary boundaries. I'm here to introduce a possible new way for us to think about how we collect and reproduce knowledge in the world. I'm also um, I'm also um, semi-aquatic, uh, and so I'll be drinking a lot of uh, water through this. I think it comes from being from Newfoundland. Uh, which is just an island out on the sea, and so uh, I have some sympathies for that. But well, well, let's start here. Uh, data science means an emerging uh, approach uh, to science that extends beyond statistics towards, in one direction, math, engineering, and computer science on the one side, but also draws liberally from the social sciences, you know, from linguistics to, uh, to computational linguistics, we might say, in that transition. Now, statistics, you know, it similarly focuses on data. If you were to go to the Wikipedia page right now for it, it says that statistics is the study of data. And I think that's perhaps a bit uh, reductive, um, but uh, but also not necessarily. It's simultaneously reductive and also imperial because certainly statistics is not the only uh, paradigm which has some sort of uh, relationship to data. And indeed, uh, we do use statistics in the book, but I would not say it's reducible uh, to it. Data science uh, seems to have emerged in the last um, uh, 20 years, perhaps, um, by virtue of our access to vast streaming or complete data. And so instead of focusing on how to understand, classify, or predict within these vast samples, but also to be careful in how they're constructed and filtered. In practice, however, uh, it's less reflective and more about uh, workflows uh, rather than claims. How do we get in a bunch of data, process it in some way, and send it out to something else? But that's data science as a practice, not data science necessarily as a scientific uh, practice. Now, that being said, I do think it's less useful to press uh, further in distinguishing fields and, and get territorial. This is sociology, this is anthropology, and there's a lot of stuff that overlaps. And similarly, data science and statistics, we may find a lot that overlaps. Um, so, I, I mean, I say instead, let's think of them as approaches to knowledge, ways in which we can, can construct or understand knowledge rather than domains of knowledge. This is not about them taking a claim. This is them taking an approach. Um, so how should data science approach knowledge? And uh, well, so what would be social data science then? Well, we might say data science is the science of the operationalization of phenomena, uh, courtesy of Dolly. Uh, so how many messages shared between two people would be enough to represent a friendship? Does, the, does it matter the time? Does it matter the content of the 
the message? Does it matter the peer relationships from which those messages are sent? Uh, and what data can help us answer this question and how can we test that answer? And that last one is really important because you may know of friends that are yours. You may know of other people's friends. You may know of uh, platforms where people signify friends, but that is not necessarily the same thing as a friendship. A friendship is in many ways uh, a latent construct that is observed or realized through the way we interact with others. To say, I know a friendship personally through experience is not the same thing as to say, I can record a friendship, I can measure it, I can say how many friends people have. The latter part is where we take phenomena and turn it into data. So social data science might be the operationalization of social life. We often have ideas about the world that needs to be translated into data. What is a friend? Or, or data that can offer us new ideas about the world. Oh my God, I've got all these Facebook friends. What does it mean? So it's not really about finding the true concept out in the world um, or attaching a dollar value. We do get a lot of uh, people from econometrics coming to us and, and they're often doing work with finance until they come here and then they do work with other things. It's not about finding um, a specific countable version, although we do do that, but it's about finding a workable value for the accretion of knowledge. How do we make knowledge a thing? Now, within that, and where I start in the book is a, um, a paradigm I think is incomplete but useful from the com uh, from computer sciences, and particularly from information visualization. And it's a, um, it's a framework, um, one might uh, find it uh, somewhat controversial, and I do myself, but called uh, DIKW. Uh, fascinatingly, on the uh, Wikipedia page to uh, data, DIKW was in the page for a few years in like the, the late aughts, and then it disappeared, and then it made a resurgence again around 2017, 2018. So in the class, I've had students kind of look for DIKW in the Wikipedia article over time. Where does it show up? When does it disappear? And I think it made a resurgence because it made sense. Well, I might say data are measurements of phenomena. Phenomena is the world. It just is but data are measurements of that phenomena. Now, information are signals from that data. And in Bateson's term, I love this phrase, it might be differences that make a difference. Now, what's knowledge then? Well, knowledge is information situated or understood in context. If we see a signal, what does that signal mean? If we see um, a whole series of um, friendships, but then we see one relationship and it seems like it's all conflict, but yet they still interact with each other. What does that mean? All of a sudden we have a signal here. It's not just like friend, 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 friend. Oh, that's interesting. It's not quite a friendship, but it's still a relationship. And now by having that, that signal, we start to think knowledge. Oh, that's because they're siblings and siblings are, are together or you're, you know, they're there forever. Family is forever, one might say. So now we can understand or we have some knowledge about the fact that, well, sometimes conflict happens in a relationship and sometimes it doesn't. What we've done is we've taken data measurements We've turned it into information where we can see differences or signals or something. And then from that, we get knowledge. Now, but ultimately, as researchers, we might be interested not necessarily in knowledge, but in wisdom. Why wisdom? We don't really talk about wisdom that much, even though I suppose we should have it. Uh, in, its, in this particular case, information outside of or in an analogous context. And that's what we don't necessarily think science accrues, but scientists accrue this. Researchers accrue this. When a student comes to me with a question, I think I'd like to study this in this domain. And I go, hmm, that might be workable or that might be not so workable. That might be really complicated. Um, what I'm doing is I'm applying wisdom. I'm applying knowledge from previous contexts about how it might apply in this one. Is it gonna work? Is it not gonna work? I don't know. But what I'm able to do is give some sense of that. Now, DIKW is not bad. Um, but it's certainly not perfect. I mean, there's a whole uh, there, there's a whole series of uh, you know thoughts from uh, philosophy on upwards on epistemology, how we know things, and this is really uh, reductive. But one of the ways in which I think it's particularly reductive and insufficient is that it starts with data. Uh, it starts with the notion that data already exists, and that's something that I really want to uh, shake up in this book here, because in social science, we don't know that data just exists. We go out and collect data. Data we collect is structured by who we are, how we ask the question, the tools we use, when we ask the question, so much of the context. And, and it turns out, we might actually just then think, we should back this up a little bit. From social science, we ought to think, phenomena, it's out there. What is it that we think we are testing, observing, 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 observing uh, expecting from the world? What is it that we expect to find? 
How are we using our intuitions, our prior academic literature, and our analytical tools to perceive or collect that phenomena? How are we taking the world and making it into data? And so how can we encode and thus measure or compare different phenomena? Is every friendship the same? What would we do to measure for a friendship? Mutuals plus a real name? Does it have to be verbally stated? Can it be observed through proximity at an event? These are all ways in which we may measure something in which we, we want to get at the phenomena. But really, it's the phenomena that matters to us, and it's the data that we use to get there. Now, from here, we might think, well, let's think beyond the interface. And this is a platitude that I use throughout the book. Um, and the interface is often because a lot of the data that we see or experience comes through in platforms or in apps, and it's already pre-given to us in some way. We have a list of people that are uh, listening to this talk or people in the room there. Um, we can, you know, we can count these things, but they're they're already available in a structure as it is. Now, we don't necessarily want the data in that structure. What if we learn to represent it in a different way? Well, we can consider performative features then. Are we making our lives amenable to data collection? Did the clock make the workday nine to five? What was the workday like before the clock? Before the clock, we structured it in a different way and the clock creates a form of structuring. So we're not merely saying people like to get up at 9 a.m. We're assuming that people understand the clock and the clock helps order the day. And once it has that order, then we can think about 9 a.m. Uh, that happens online where we had vast discussions about whether a Facebook friend is a real friend, whether a like or a heart on Twitter means an endorsement or just a bookmark. Um, we are producing the world, not merely learning from it. Now we can ask about consequences. You know, do some sites structure data in ways that change our behavior? Do we speak to people less on their birthdays and use a Facebook greeting instead? Has Hallmark now had a go at Facebook because now we, the consequences of social media suggest that uh, now we are changing our behavior. We're not just being produced by it, but we're shaping our behavior. And of course, we also can and should consider beyond the interface. It's not just Facebook, it's the people off Facebook. It's not just Twitter, the people off Twitter or those who don't feel comfortable on Twitter. Who is excluded when we observe certain data? Does their exclusion create a biased claim? You know, if we just say, here's our data set, now let's classify it, we, we might ask who's not in that data set? What is not in that data set? If we've discovered that a platform, when it finds uh, content that it thinks to be from bots or from trolls or something, if it deletes that content, and then we want to go, we want to estimate how much content is a bot or, or is, a, you know, spam or something, we go to them, hey, let's collect the data. Well, we deleted all that data. Well, now we're creating a biased claim. And so really, it's, it's not the data that we're interested in again. It's the phenomena and how that phenomena relates to the data. In doing so, of course, does it reinforce unequal power relations? We don't get too deep in that in the book. It's a book on coding at the end of the day. But it's one to be mindful of, and it kind of suffuses through everything. So really, this is all just the stuff that we talk about in chapter one. And that gets us to the point. We think, why don't we use code for this? Well, the programmer to code is a practice of specifying some consistent phrases that will perform an operation that can be reliably repeated. Now, I use code in Python, but there's a variety of languages. In fact, we, we use something like code whenever we, we do um, a, a very regular practice. You know, you might think you, you could encode the practice of tying a shoe, although that would be very complicated to specify. Just think about it. It's not just like lift this one over there. There's really a lot going on. Well, in a, um, uh, in a computer code, we put a lot of those things in there uh, in, in a lot of very specific detail. We tell exactly what we want to do with that code. Now, data refers to measurements. So when we're coding for data, we're expecting consistent measurements. That might be good. That might be bad. Um, but that's what we're, what we're looking for. We treat all the Facebook friends as friends, uh, uh, for example. Now, of course, we don't need computers to do this. Uh, we don't need computers to even do social data science. Um, it's just that, that it helps. Uh, it helps a lot because they can do it at scale. We could very meticulously, and if you go back and look at work from the 60s and the 70s with contact diaries, for example, people would very meticulously say, who have I spoken to today or in the last hour? They're using a coded way of doing this, but then analyzing that data is a real trial and it limits how big we can scale. It limits what we can compare. So computer code helps us um, with a lot of that. So now the world is full of expectations and surprises. Things are just 
they happen out of sample or they happen in ways that we didn't anticipate. So that means our coding needs to make compromises. Sometimes we have missing data. Sometimes we have data that's, you know, one text is really long and one is short. If the code is too complex and catches everything, uh, it might be too hard to understand. It might be very messy, very fragile code. Uh, it might be too hard to write. And if the code is too simple, then it might be coarse or we might risk misunderstanding the world. We're using a, we're using a sledgehammer when we should use a scalpel. So how do we use our code effectively? Well, first, we might think of what code does, and there's a couple ways that code orders the world. One is that it creates a list. A list is a sequence, one thing, then the other, then the other. This is like a sentence, or this is like um, a, a, a line of tweets from a profile. It's just a line. Now, a dictionary, on the other hand, is a relational mapping. Sometimes we think about the world in terms of, uh, I give you a, a fruit and a color. I say purple and round, and then you say grape, or maybe someone says plum. And so what that is, is that's a dictionary. It doesn't have to be in any specific order. It's just there's associations, mappings between the variables or between the objects. And finally, there's a set. We can think of things as either being in or out. People are inside a group or they're not inside a group. People are inside a, um, a platform. They have an account or they don't, or they, they did say something or they didn't say something. Now, virtually all the more complex ways of ordering data just come from these. So you really should get good with these as a, as a a rationality as a way of thinking about this. What sort of stuff can we can we turn into a like? I say Apple, you say Granny Smith. And what sort of ways can we turn into? What are the list off the days of the week? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Understanding how these relate enables you to appreciate that data, and it turns out they're also the basic collection types in Python. So that's the stuff that you would really want to get good at and know really simple even before getting into the book. So once, once we get into it, then we start looking at the tools. Now, a lot of folks might start with a toy exercise, say, um, hey, download these data from Twitter. Well, that poor book right now. Um, I anticipated that sort of stuff. And after teaching a course like this for many years, uh, I actually thought it's better to get at the tools first um, and give a sense of like, what are the tools that we're using in order to inhabit that data, much in the same way, if you're a painter, you might practice painting with a paintbrush or painting really carefully. You're doing sort of toy examples. Hi, come on in. Um, so the first important one is a series. A series has the properties of both a list and a dictionary. It has a thing where we can have a, an order by sequence, but we can also have a mapping. And it turns out that that makes it really useful uh, for being able to manage and store data. A lot of data we can put in a series. Now, one series is not very good. What is this? This is uh, a number of days of the week, and this is a number of, this is a series of numbers or a collection of numbers, we might say. Um, now, what gets interesting about this is when we think about multiple series that are all aligned. And so this might be actually hours of sleep. And then we have Monday, name the, or the number of hours, what should be named, uh, location and quality. And now all of a sudden we have measured certain things, but what we're really interested in is not this. What we're really interested in is, did I have a good night's sleep? <laughs> or did you have a good night's sleep? Or did the subject have a good night's sleep? The good night's sleep is this latent phenomenon. And these are the ways in which we encode and measure it. And we take different encodings, and then we try to work with them in some way to make sense of that. Some of those might be statistical, we might say. They might be inferential. Some of them might just be looking. Here's a, a real obvious one. Here's use your intuition. You can see there that when I was traveling, that was probably the worst night's sleep that I had. That's a real simple claim. How well do we generalize that claim? Well, that becomes a matter of um, you know, nuance and art, but the basis of the claim is already there in the data. And it's not a claim about data. We're using data to make a claim about the world, about phenomena, in this case, about sleep. So now it turns out that you know, one simple table of people or anything, and then some data about them is not good enough. Um, the data out there in the world comes in all kinds of different forms. When you download data um, from Twitter or Facebook, Reddit, when you download data from Office of National Statistics or a variety of other places, it might not be in that structure or in a structure you need. So we need to get that data in a structure we need. We might have a series of web pages and we just want, you know, the number of links on that web page. And so in chapter four, we look at file types because these are all the ways that data are going to come in. Um, but they're going to come in in two broad classes of ways, either as a, as a rectangle um, or as a, as a hierarchical structure. If you've ever coded a web page, that's a hierarchical structure. You know, we start with uh, just HTML, and then it's title, and then it's the title, 
and then the end of the title, and then it's body, and then it's some tag, and another tag. And these are all ways in which stuff is nested. Nested data is not very good. We want data in a rectangle so that we can compare those measurements. So we look at how to reshape those things into the rectangles that we want. And then we look in chapter five, how to combine those rectangles together. I'll keep it that loose for now. And then the trouble begins. <laughs> So at this point, we have our tools. We know that we, uh, we want to get data into a rectangle, and we do that in order to make comparisons across those rectangles and hopefully say something about the world. But where are we going to get the data? Now, we're often, well, we're going to get the data from the world itself, and that's where the trouble begins. The next two chapters in this book were the two most precarious um, in the entire book itself, and that is because they deal with data from the outside world. Now, as a book on social data science or computational social science or something of that nature, you, 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 know, you may think, well, let's get data from Twitter. Uh, and I do. I do indeed get some data from Twitter. But uh, I am very happy. Uh, I'm very happy now that I didn't base this book around Twitter. Uh, <laughs> and, and I knew because I wasn't working on Twitter when most people were. Ten years ago, I was working on Facebook data. And that Facebook data um, was uh, around 2005, just went kaput, just gone. Uh, and it's interesting because some of that data, I think we should still have access to. For example, you can give Facebook a uh, list of your uh, uh, your contacts. You can give it access to your contact book. Um, and so it says, oh, I'm going to take all those names and I'm going to compare them to who is on Facebook. But can you get that list back down? Can you get the list of your friends back down? Well, not really, actually. You can't. You can't programmatically do that from Facebook. So there's some asymmetries already there. Now, there was a time when you could get that friend list and including who's friends with who. And I really enjoyed using that, working with that data, showing that data to other people. And so they would get insights about that. They go, wow, that's my social network. That's super cool. And then it disappeared. Um, and so I, uh, I had a very early teachable moment in this that a number of people are going through right now, which is you can't trust these APIs. You can't trust data access. So these two chapters are not a chapter on Twitter and a chapter on Facebook. They are rather... Um, they're a chapter first on how we access data from the open web, and then how we access data from the web when it's authenticated. And the open web is just you point a browser at something and the data comes down to you. So there's some fundamental basics of that you got to uh, you know, know if you want to get that data. Um, we do that all the time. You go to a web page, you enter the web page, down comes data. You just don't store it in a, in a shaped form. You kind of just well, read the page. Um, but we want to store that data in some way. We want to make use of it. So I, I cover how to get that data down and uh, then how to iterate, for example, through a, a number of pages through a thing called paging. So you might say you want page one, it's the first list of results, page two, the second list, and so forth. Um, I don't get too deep into the technical aspects of that, just enough so that you can feel that you can do it. And then I leave it to the reader to think about how they might want to expand the scope of this. In the second half of the chapter instead, I focus on research ethics. Uh, and you, research ethics are pretty big, I will say, and I can't cover all of them here. Instead, I wanted to do two things. First, I wanted to suffuse the book with a notion of power or a notion that, you know, some data is in there to be seen, some isn't. It's not necessarily yours for the taking, but you should think about how you are producing work. And are you just analyzing what's there or thinking about how to include what's maybe excluded. So that's a more of a broad theme throughout the whole book. But in this chapter, I talk about data minimization uh, as a practice and how it applies to a lot of data online. Um, and data minimization might be like not taking more than you need, not taking it faster than you need, and not trying to triangulate it across different sites if you don't need to do that. Uh, and that practice helps us think that what we are doing is carefully taking what we need rather than just feeling entitled to all this data. And that is why I started with that practice. Not because um, it's necessarily the most essential, but because I want us to get into the headspace of thinking that we're not entitled to this data, that we are using this data and that we ought to take it with some responsibility, that we are um, we're seeking to make a good claim with this data, and that by doing good by the servers and by other people, that we can justify or feel good in taking that data, rather than just, oh, I'm going to slurp up uh, several terabytes of this, and I hope I'm going to do something with it. 
um, because we, we know that that can be really uh, complicated. Now, in chapter seven, I talk about authenticated data. And so I go through different ways in which you authenticate, one of which is with Twitter, but it's not for Twitter per se. It's for the notion that sometimes the server wants to know who you are. They want to know that you have access to this data, not other people. So maybe it's because you have an API token, maybe because it's your personal data, it, but for whatever reason, you will need to share with the server some way of saying, hey, it's me. And so we look at the really simplest ways of doing that. Uh, and then we look at ways that are slightly more tricky using a, a thing called the CAT API, uh, which is just a real simple API. It's cute. It should be around for a while. It's just for testing, uh, for testing APIs. Then we look at uh, Twitter using a kind of a roll your own. So I do it by scratch with the, the V2 API, uh, just get some simple data down from there. That should still be available, although unfortunately now I think it's for cost. Um, and then I, uh, I look at Reddit through a thing called a, uh, a wrapper. So like there's a lot, there's libraries in Python that make a lot of this simpler for people. You normally, you just put up your credentials uh, into a like create Reddit object. And then now you can use that Reddit object to ask, hey, what are the top stories today? What are all the stories from this subreddit and so forth? And so that process of authenticating really important. And I cover it in that general way so that even if Twitter or Reddit go kaput, you can understand the logic of how you would authenticate to a website because that process is going to endure. We got some data, it's in the right shape, things are going good. Now I think is a good time to think about research questions. And normally in a, um, say in a graduate program, we might do research questions right away. What's your research question? What's your, what's your research question? Oh, I don't know what we're, it's changing all the time. And, and so, uh, yeah, if it's changing all the time and you're not sure, it doesn't sound like we're gonna get off on the right foot if we're starting with research questions. <laughs> we're just gonna freak people out. Uh, and I don't think you should start with research questions. I think you should start with research intuitions. Um, and then you should go read and see how your intuitions match with the literature. But moreover than that, I think you should kind of get a sense of what tools will be at your disposal and what domains will be at your disposal before really drilling into those research questions. Um, and so this is kind of a, a pivot point in the book. There's no code in here. And um, I'm going to see if I can get from the publisher a, a, a freebie copy of this particular chapter, because I, I think it's useful for a lot of people, regardless of whether they're using code or not. Um, you know, I, uh, I cover a few key principles here. These are some pretty important ones, and they help us understand how to like rein in and put some put some structure to our data. Um, and so, for example, the top one I think is really important: induction, deduction, abduction. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. But I think the most important of all of these um, is prediction, um, or sorry, is expectation and observation. Um, I think, and this is, I'll be bold about this, I'll think that the negotiation between expectation and observation is the most central to scientific research. In fact, I would say it is the scientific practice and everything else are details. Um, expectation is what we have. It's what we expect coming from past scientific research and from our life experience. We're not just doing other people's research, but we're we're kind of filtering that research through our own minds, through our own ideas, through our own experiences. Now, we need to be critical of past insights. We need to ask, in whose interest did they serve? Or what is the strength of evidence for those claims? We need to be judicious. We need to consider um, whether what we expect is should come from the past literature. And in this case, we often reason by analogy. And we posit a justification for collecting and analyzing new data. Analogy is, an, I think, an under underappreciated aspect of reasoning here, because we have to reason to some extent by analogy because we're looking at somewhere else. And we say, well, this somewhere else is kind of like the somewhere we know. It might be a bit different, it might not be different. Here's what we should expect. And then when we set up those set expectations, then we go out and observe. You know, what we observe comes from the availability and the sophistication of our tools. It comes from our own positionality. It comes from the accessibility of data and from the ethical and moral justifications of our own investigation. Uh, you know, we can't just observe everything. We have to observe some specific things. Some tools make things easier to observe or not. I would really like to be able to do a study where I, um, I film how close or how far people are apart in a public space. 
and then code that by different intersectional qualities. I might think that some people are less friendly to others. Are old people being ignored? Are the homeless, does nobody look at them? Well, we could stand out next to them. We could use a camera. If we use a camera, are we actually going to map the people correctly? Do we know that? Well, we have some expectations and how do we observe that? Well, you know, and, and also for our own positionality, why do I want to, observe? who do I want to observe? Do I want to observe um, people who I think are vulnerable? Do I want to observe how to be the most successful to navigate this space? Those are ways in which we might take this example, just looking at people and navigate that. We're not seeing everything. We're looking at some things. What are those some things we're looking at? Now, uh, and I said here first, I said, well, we cannot see if we do not know where or how to look. But then I thought that might be a bit ableist because not everyone can see. And it's not just oh, um, um, what's it, oracular. Um, it's not just of the eye, right? You know, it's of the mind. So I also then say, well, we cannot hear if we don't know where or how to listen. It's the same sort of thing here. We need to know where or how to look. And where and how to look is not how where and how to look to make sense for our own experience. We know how to do that naturally. We just go about our day and talk to people and stuff. It's where and how to look to make a distribution from which we can make a comparison. And that's how we look from a, from a scientific or from a data scientific point of view. And here I also want to give a postmodern appeal. Um, a lot of work right now um, in a data science-y type way and coming perhaps from, a, from the natural sciences takes a sort of self-evidence to data. Well, the data's there, so why don't we analyze that data? But if you recall, starting from the beginning of this, I was saying that it's not just that we start with data, we start with phenomena. And when we start with phenomena, we have to operationalize it. And for that, I want to give an appeal to abduction. Abduction first, perhaps first, um, fully articulated by Charles Sanders Peirce. And uh, in a, in a, he has some really great articles um, but uh, I think how to make our ideas clear is, uh, is my favorite. He's, he's two articles in Scientific American in the mid 1800s. Uh, now, abduction has, if you go to the like lightest Wikipedia version now, we'll say reasoning from the, the, the best possible or the most obvious circumstance. And that's not true. Uh, that is quasi true. It's qu almost true. It's actually reasoning um, from like uh, what is the most obvious or the best possible circumstances from your perspective, from what you think. And what you think is based on your intuition. And your intuition is based on how you've learned and how you've lived and, and where you've been. Um, we don't want to get rid of that. But nor do we want to get in a place where we can't do data science because we can't think the measurements are possible um, or that we can't even analyze unless we think the measurements are viewable by only some kinds of people. Um, we have to be able to navigate our own personal experiences. Um, I have my own intersectionalities, uh, issues with uh, mental health. I'm, I'm a queer person. I might end up seeing the world in a slightly different way uh, than someone who's neurotypical or someone uh, who is straight. Uh, and But I don't want to say that only only queer people can ask these questions or only queer people can answer them or you know, only people who have ADHD or autism or something can, can ask or answer questions. No, but I do think that we have a different perspective by, by virtue of where we come from. And that is abduction. And we can then translate that abduction into something else, either into a deductive or an inductive research question and then apply those research questions. And so I talked through that, but I also wanna give a shout out to this paper, it's really cool. I don't love it, but I love it. Um, and the reason I don't love it is because I think that facial recognition is a rights-based matter, not necessarily an empirical matter, but I do love it because it's a brilliant study uh, and it's effective, it was an effective study. It got a lot of play really quickly and actually made some changes to laws as a consequence. This study worked and what was it? It was a study of how um, facial recognition was much better with white male faces than with black female faces. And would I have thought of that study? Probably not. I probably wouldn't have thought of that. It wouldn't have occurred to me. I wouldn't have necessarily had that intuition. The two, uh, the two um, authors, they're black women. And they would have had that intuition. And I want, I, I want to believe that that intuition could be translated into a practice that anyone could do. It didn't need to meet and joy to go and code the faces and do the ML. You could have done it if you had their code. 
But they had that insight, they had that intuition that they translated through abduction into a workable research project. And now we know a little more about the world. We know a little more about phenomena and how those phenomena are, or in this case, inadequately translated into data. That we didn't translate some phenomena correctly or accurately or adequately. Should we have? Should we make sure everybody is now surveyed with fac uh, facial detection? I don't know, but I think we can't have that conversation if it works for some people, not others. If it's a rights-based uh, question, it should be rights-based because it works for everyone or doesn't work for everyone or should or shouldn't. And so by, by thinking about our intersectional positions, we can integrate that into this sort of work. It's not just the world's out there. We can use our own intuitions. Um, but then once we do this, then we've got to go back to code and that's the boring. <laughs> no, I don't think it's boring. Uh, so in, uh, in chapter nine, um, and we only got a few chapters left. Uh, in chapter nine, it's probably the most complex chapter in the book. I've thought about having a chapter on visualization and that just ended up being very like, here you do this and then you do this. And a chapter on some elementary statistics and it just became very toyish. And then I realized, um, let's leave that to the statisticians. So in this chapter, what I try to do is show how we can use both visualization and statistics together and sometimes apart to understand the difference between what we expect and what we observe. Because uh, in both places, that's what they're doing. Uh, statistics use a lot of base assumptions, they use a model, and the model might be, um, you know, a Gaussian distribution, it might be a normal curve, or it might be a uniform distribution, it might be like everything should be equally observable. That's a model. And then when we go out and observe things, do we see everything equally being observed? Does, does every child get exactly the same number of meals? Does, you know, does every, uh, does every student get the same amount of research income? That should be, that should be even. If it's not even, then we observe something different than we expect. And then we want to, want to go look at that. So I do that first through a univariate statistics, just one distribution. And so I use a uniform distribution. I actually use uh, average births in the UK over the year. It turns out it's not uniform. Um, there are both trends and outliers. A and so trends and outliers, two different qualitatively different ways of showing how our, our observations might be different than our expectations. And we tidy that up and I show how to take kind of rough looking visualizations. And I, and I like this one. This is as clean of visualization as I can make. This little one in the corner right here, it's, a, it's in the book on visualizations. I use annotations, a trend line, and a, the whole kit and caboodle just to show you that you can tell a story with a visualization. Um, and then we get to, uh, I guess, the, the last part of the book, part four. And that's social data science skills and practice. Uh, so I didn't use Twitter data, I used Stack Exchange. Now, why Stack Exchange? Um, a lot of people who are learning to code uh, use Stack Overflow, which is the big Stack Exchange on coding. Um, I used a smaller one, the movie Stack Exchange. The reason is that it was light. Uh, a lot of people have experience with movies. Uh, you can download it yourself and it's available. It's always available on the internet archive. And so by being available on the internet archive, that has a sort of robustness in the way that I was never really sure if I could store or keep the data for this book. There's some toy data that I can keep, but having access to real live data was really tricky. We can't have an archive of tweets that we share with other people, but what I can, I can point people to an internet archive of Stack Exchange and be really confident that that's going to be there in the future because it's because the rights of it say so. And even if they say, I'm gonna turn off the API, or I'm gonna charge for the API, those archives are still gonna be there. So you can always go back and look through them. Now, I don't just use that. In fact, in one chapter, I use OxCOVID data for a little bit in the end, but I mainly use Stack Exchange here. And these are for the silo chapters. In chapter 10, which is probably the most useful chapter in the book, we take raw data and then we turn it into slightly more cooked data. So we take a bunch of letters and say, well, these, these characters actually mean numbers. Let's make them a number. Or these characters mean a date. Let's make it a date. And once we have it a uh, once we have it in a date time, then we can do things. We can say, what happened on a Monday? What happened in 2003? But you can't do that um, very easily uh, if you just have raw data. You do that more easily by, by having that data cleaned up in some way, extracting the links from text, for example. And then once we have that first, you know, not quite salmonella tier raw data, 
uh, then we can do more interesting stuff with it. And the interesting stuff for the social world, in my opinion, uh, is often structured in these four ways, either by language, what sort of language or communication is used? Um, not just which language, but what language? Uh, how do they talk? When do they talk? Can we classify speech? Can we clean it up so that we know the most important words? Um, then time uh, is covered in chapter 12. Can we get our data set so we can look at a trend over time? Can we have a moving window? Can we filter down to a specific period of time? Relations are covered in chapter 13 on social network analysis. Uh, there we say, well, if I reply to a certain commenter, then there's a relationship between me and that person that I reply to. If I denote a friendship between uh, myself and someone else, then, then that's a relation. Relations make a difference. People are not merely anonymous online. And even when they are, there's still emergent properties that happen from these relationships. Uh, we don't cover a huge amount in this chapter, but really the basis of like, how do we encode a relation? Is it something that I send? Do I send money? Do I send information? Or is it something that we share? Is it a state on or off? Do, or do we have a friendship or not? We don't send a friendship to someone, but we might you know, send greetings and stuff, but we, we either have or don't. So those are kind of some basic units that we need to think about. And then we build up from there relations like clusters and things and see whether there's you know, blobs of anti-vaxxers and blobs of health people not talking to each other or whatever. Um, but it all comes down to like, can we encode it as a relation and can we structure it in that way in order to ask those questions? Finally, space is covered in chapter 14. And again, it's, it's, this one's a very, very superficial chapter, but it's uh, similarly, how do we project things onto space? Things are often spatially located. People are spatially located. So we should be able to make a map. We should be able to calculate a distance between things or otherwise appreciate something conditioned on space. Um, also, and in space, because of uh, the nature of maps, uh, there's, a, there's a very common um, visualization called a choropleth. And a choropleth is where like, you have a, have a map and, and some things are like one country is dark and one country is light. And you don't just have a smooth gradation of countries. You might chunk it up into four or five different bins. So the way that we chunk a bin um, and sort of chop it up it, we can do that in ways that are thoughtful, or we can just say, yeah, take uh, the first 20%, the second 20%, the, and so forth. Um, well, we first do the obvious way, just, you know, the first half and the second half, or 25, 25, 25, 25. But then we might think, actually, these people on this long tail, they really represent one chunk, so let's put them there. And, and then these people in the middle represent one chunk, so let's put them there. Um, now, that gets us to the end of the book. And in the end of the book, we haven't like done a research project, but what you have done is have had an experience with tools, uh, how those tools can manage that data, how you can structure that data, and how you can think about what's in or out. Then hopefully make ask questions about that data yourself that you feel more comfortable with at the end of that book. Um, and so now um, the final chapter is real short. And I uh, just say, uh, and I want to make you appeal to think of data as the new garden. Again, hat tip to Dolly. Um, um, the uh, the notion of uh, I don't even need to put a um, I don't even need to put a source because they all got little watermarks in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, gosh, the phrase "the data is the new oil" is so vulgar. I mean, not the least of which is that uh, if we don't get uh, you know carbon under control, we're in big trouble, right? So, uh, I mean, let's not try to aspire to the next thing that could be uh, uh, you know destroy the planet um, or our in it's in it's it's habit. Ability, its ability to be inhabited, <laughs> inability. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's not use data to uh, to make this place inhabitable um, in the way that we're probably using oil to do that and go broke uh, along the way. Um, oil is taken from here and then used here. We think that there's a pot of oil. It's a big pot. We're, we believe that maybe it's kind of regenerating a little bit, but not very much, uh, and pretty slowly. And so we take it and then we use it. And then when we use it, it creates carbon and goes out in the atmosphere. Okay, it's not really a good metaphor because the data is what we're doing when we encode or impose order on the world around us. We take phenomena and we turn them into measurements. And then we take those measurements and compare them in order to you know, go back and understand that phenomena. Not to understand a different phenomena, to, to the very place. So if we discover that um, the happiest tweets are at uh, five in the evening, and then we go out and we uh, share that with people, 
And, and then people are going to start tweeting at five to convince others they're happy. <laughs> uh, or, or, you know, uh, if, if the most successful tweets, oh gosh, imagine, imagine successful, if we had a good measure of successful, uh, if we had the most successful tweets are happening in the morning, then you just know the crypto people and everyone else is going to start tweeting in the morning. And what will happen is that we will fed back into the system. And the system will have changed because we fed it back. We encoded phenomena, we put it into data, and then we sent it back out as phenomena. And that happens a lot. And we kind of want that to happen. We, we do. We want to we want to minimize hate speech. We want to create human flourishing. We want to make it more effective for people to get their message from point A to point B. Or we want people to be heard. We we want it to feed back. We don't by burning oil, we don't want to change the oil in the ground, but by, by using data, we want to change the phenomena that the data is based on. So we might think of it as gardening. It's a bit structured to begin with. It involves tending uh, that we don't, um, we can overwater it. We can over harvest it and have nothing left. We can have a site much like, uh, you know, um, Horizon World's metaverse, which is just feels like this total bubble of surveillance. And it just gets really weird on your, on your head. And you're like, well, I'm not sure if I want that. Um, and we can ask questions, but when are there spaces when we don't want to record any data? Even politically, I don't mention it in the book, but this right here is a sticker that says no photos. It's it's from a uh, it's from a club, and uh, the club wants no photos because it has a lot of queer people there, and those queer people may not necessarily represent so well uh, as queer in their daily life to others, and so they don't want to be recorded. They want that to be a safe space. And I want that to be a safe space. So I don't want to go in there and say, can I have permission to take photographs of you? No, we want to be able to see that some places are worth governing in some ways with data and some aren't. And we should have the wisdom to know the difference. So, you know, then we think, well, where do we go from here? So I give examples of some key conferences, some texts, some places, some sites of future learning. Uh, and uh, then that's it, that's the book. So what have I learned in this book? Well, it's not a book on ML or AI. We barely scratch the surface, but I think it gets you set up for that. I mean, in the NLP chapter, we cover naive Bayes, which is like super basic, but that's the point. I just want it to be super basic because I, I just want to get you into the notion that you can classify things and, you know, some classifications work better than others. And then you go out and use the, the heavy duty classifiers. We don't really look at multivariate regression, but we do look at how to manage when we have um, three variables and how to use one variable to compare between the two of them. <clears throat> They're deliberately there to keep things simple. It's not meant to be a text on stats. It's meant to be a text to help you feel comfortable wielding data and making comparisons. Now, um, if I did it again, I'd probably want a chapter on visual analysis, maybe one on how to detect faces or objects or other things. We can encode that. That is available now. But I think some of these tools will really help you along the way to there, and you'll feel much more confident or comfortable maybe going to OpenCV once you have uh, had a look at this. And so in the end, returning to the science of measurement, the book introduces the ideas, tools, and some theories related to measurement of social life through data. We do not simply take data from the world, but produce data in the world. The types of data uh, produced have a structure of their own. You know, we can, the data can be nested, hierarchical, sequential, relational, we kind of covered them. And then data has a correspondence to the world. You know, it's not just random data. Um, it measures time. It measures space, it measures the relationships between people, and it measures uh, behavior and communication. We are ultimately not interested in data per se, and that's perhaps why we are not, um, strictly speaking, uh, statistics or machine learning. It does matter what data we use and what that data corresponds to, not just how we can create an algorithm that does something better with it. We're interested in social cohesion, we're interested in support, conflict, hate speech. As we measure these things, we do not simply understand them, but we change them. And it's up to us to do this in a way that is meaningful, fair, ethical, and ultimately intelligible. So if you're sold on the book, here's what you need. Um, you might need some introductory Python and JupyterLab. How to get intro to Python? There's a thousand one courses out there. I didn't want to make the first bit of the book on intro to Python because it's been done to, done to death. Um, including me. I've got my own Introducing Python uh, book. You can go to this GitHub page, get Introducing Python. It's got a PDF there, and it's also got the books as these uh, live JupyterLab notebooks that you can use yourself and you can walk through the entire book. I actually wrote this book similarly as a series of JupyterLab notebooks as well, but because it's been published by Sage, who put a lot of work into this themselves, um, the JupyterLab notebooks don't have the uh, writing 
most of the writing in the book, but they do have all the code and they have all the code and they have all the headers. And so if you see code in this book, then you can you can see that code in the Jupyter Notebook and walk through it step by step. And they're all freely available. Um, you know, my GitHub FSSTDS from Social Science 2 Data Science. The book is available online. It's an ebook or as a paper copy. It's uh, cheap on Amazon. I have a, a personal discount, but uh, it's still just the same as the Amazon price. <laughs> uh, if you don't like Amazon, that's it. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're not into uh, Amazon, obviously uh, Sage have it themselves. If you're an instructor, uh, feel free to inspect a or request an inspection copy um, of the book. Now, coming shortly, the Sage Learning Portal for this book will have PowerPoint slides and multiple choice quizzes. And that should be by the uh, by the end of this month. Uh, they're all mostly done right now and uh, drafts are available upon request. I've got the first um, oh, 11 to 15 chapters done with uh, nice PowerPoint slides. Many of them I've given in the, uh, a course in the fall and uh, the rest in the end of the month, and same for the multiple choice quizzes. Thereafter, uh, and I also have partially available, because if you go to the uh, this GitHub, you'll see a link to these, but there's only like 10 of them available now, and there needs to be more. Um, PowerPoint uh, that I talk through, and I talk through both uh, the chapters with PowerPoint, but also with the Jupyter Lab slides. Uh, so you can, you can listen to those and see me in a slightly less mulleted form. I suppose from, from earlier this year, but I'll have more of those available. So those are the resources. We look forward to that. And oh my God, and those are extra slides, adept ones. We don't need those. Uh, that's because I, the reason why I use those where they're there is because I borrowed this template from uh, these slides. And so here they are. Here's an example of what our slides look like uh, when I do them. And these are all images from the book. There's no extra stuff in there. So you can also see these in the book itself. There's, it goes chapter by chapter. Um, and uh, let's see, here is what the GitHub itself looks like. Um, if I can, oh, oh, I see what's happening. I'm clicking on Zoom things because it's, uh, uh, because it's got all these overlays on my, uh, on my screen. There we are, here we go. And uh, yeah, you can see there's the chapters, data exercises, images, and supplemental notebooks. In the, in the supplemental notebooks, uh, there's things like how to use virtual environments, uh, and um, other things that just wouldn't fit. Uh, and then in the notebooks, it's literally the whole book itself. Each one of those, you can also click to open in Google Collab or in Binder. So you don't even need to run it on your own computer. You can, you can do the book almost just directly from the, uh, from the GitHub page uh, itself. So if we go into chapters there, uh, in fact, if you click on them in GitHub, it renders, um, uh, it renders them all, but you'll see here, that you know, if there's not much code, then you're not going to see much text, but all the code is there. And I do have all the output of the code from myself so that you can then clear that output and compare your output to what I had there um, ideally. Um, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to do this as a book. Uh, I thought it was a cool experience for myself. Um, I don't know if I would do another textbook again right away. <laughs> because it, it has an insane amount of meticulous detail in there that I, I just don't, I did not, I was not ready for. Um, things that change all the time and really making sure it's really consistent and that the code is simple and clear. Uh, that the wisdom in this is also simple and clear. It should be able to be the sort of thing that you would read in five years and still feel like you're learning something, not just that this is a book for 2023 when the all the social media were in the state that they were in. Um, this year was the first time I taught this as a whole book and it felt different. It felt that I wasn't simply um, sending out a series of practices, but I was trying to explain this concept of how we take phenomena and turn it to data and the ways that we do that for people. So it worked really well for me. I was really happy that I got to do it. And I really would just love to share it with you. And so thank you for listening. Oh, um, do we pause for the questions or do they stay? And I know that people need to be gone soon. You can take questions. We can edit it down if we need to. Sure. Okay. Uh, uh, David in the back was first. No, yet you guys. Uh, thank you so much. Just a brief question because I actually have to run. Yeah. Uh, you talk a lot about uh, how social science has transformed to data science and how uh, we should approach um, social science research in the data science time we are living in. Uh, but are you also referring to like the um, crisis of theory that has developed? in um, view of all the data. Uh, I'm particularly referring to economics as being you know, one of the very particular forms of social sciences where we have seen um, 
huge uh, amounts of questioning and criticism after the financial crisis and after observing more and more data points pointing yes. toward the fact that the so-called theories in economics oftentimes have no um uh, yeah i've well, seen got to be reflected in data sure so how the theory i get the social scientists is affected by the rise of data in the in, in the interest of brevity i'll, I'll try to be brev uh, <laughs> and uh okay so economics uh has a bit of a problem from the very get-go because it starts off as a deductive science uh and in fact it's also even a performative science without acknowledging its own performativity a market is a tool for effectively uh, you know establishing the price of something we might also say a market is a tool for establishing responsibility chains but a market is a tool it is not simply self-evident that a market works we had bartering before we had uh we did, actually no that's not true apparently we had bartering after markets not before that was one of those really weird insights um we thought it was bartering and then we couldn't find out how to divide the sheep to make the cow and so we create numbers but no before before markets we didn't have numeracy in that practice so we actually treated the resources differently economics has to confront the fact that it's performative it's trying to impose a rational view on the world because of uh, a, a need to optimize utility rather than discover the optimal utility of things and in doing so it can accept a little bit more um, resilience uh in the face of you know how phenomena and data sometimes don't always correspond in the same way and to that end I don't necessarily think it it has to be a crisis of theory the notion of replicable replicability assumes you know um steady states but they're not um uh, steady states uh within that gosh we get a lot of econometricians and so I'd probably defer to them to uh to answer uh, a little more uh more fully and no I don't think we have to do everything this way but one thing I do think that everyone needs as in economists certainly is appreciation for abduction that it uh that we do in, internalize certain values and concepts and we read them through our models and we should you know lean into that not because it makes our work biased but because it makes our work interesting and that we lean into the practices of science to mitigate that bias but we lean into our own sentiments in order to figure out what we want to look at in the first place I hope that that's as good as I'm going to be able to give in the time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, this is not a question. This is just a brief note of appreciation and congratulation. So as a student of multiple of your courses, I got the pleasure to work with early drafts of this. And this is a very engaging textbook. And in combination with the great video lectures and the Jupyter notebooks, it's a top notch invaluable learning resource. So big congratulations, and um, I'm excited that more people get access to this now. I'd be, wow, wow. Do we have to edit that out? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, was, I was not paid to say Let's that. It. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, actually, I, I want to hear from you, because you, you probably have one of the earliest versions of this, because you were here a while ago taking data wrangling and, yeah. and that sort of stuff. But you probably questions not about that. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the um, very kind comment. Um, my question is about um, qualification methods in the social data science pipeline. Mm -hmm. Where do you see core methods fitting in at various stages? So at the beginning, in terms mm -hmm. of informing what kind of data you collect during or coding or waking data, and after so Ooh. data science informing mm -hmm. interviews or whatever. Qualitative methods are a really useful way for us to be closer to phenomena than to data. Uh, you know, if I don't think I, I I disagree with the grounded theory notion that everything is data. I think any, any everything is the potential to be encoded as data. But by by conflating phenomena and data, we just do a disservice to both. Um, qualitative methods focus on phenomena first, not how do we transform it into data, uh, and that is really useful because that can help us with intuition and with abduction, especially if we don't know, if we don't, if we have no idea where we're going with this using our brains our brains are still pretty amazing but uh, beyond that qualitative methods um well it, it just end up themselves becoming generally more systematic what I'm articulating here is more about reasoning than it is about tools or I want to believe it's more about reasoning than tools so though that reasoning can apply um as long as we're encoding the world in some way so some of that reasoning is inductive or deductive do we start with the theory? Do we start with a firm set of expectations from which we want to distinguish two things? We can do that qualitatively because we don't really know what of the phenomenon we're going to code, but we do have a theory that's going to be this or that, that these people are happier than those or whatever. It could start inductively. We don't have any idea. Now, what we do inductively, we can either 
you know, make it systematic and comparable like a distribution in social data science or not. We don't have to make it systematic, but then it's probably not really data science per se, except to the extent that it's speaking to how do we measure and encode the world. Um, I think a lot of things can look at that. We can qualitatively think of some things as social data science by thinking that what we're doing is critiquing and understanding what gets encoded as data, how it gets encoded as data, and what's left out. Uh, and because we don't, we're not trying to test per se, uh, it's still entirely viable, but in the end, it should move in the ser service of better knowledge about the encoding process, the, the glue between phenomena and, uh, and data. And it's also a way in which I kind of tried to think vis-a-vis -vis abduction about intersectionality, because I think our positionality makes a difference. And that shows up a lot in qualitative work in the way it might not in quantitative work, because in qualitative work, often in front of other people, we're confronted with our own positionality in a way that we can sometimes hide behind that if we're, we're just taking data that's already been produced and trying to make a claim about it. But those things are important because they help us give us better intuitions and determine which and what things can be formally encoded to test hypotheses and which can't, but are still of value because they help elevate our understanding of the world. Thank you. Question online, by the way. Oh, great. Oh, how do you think Jet? What do you think ChatGPT? Does it mean data science will prevail? Oh gosh, it's <laughs> it's. Um, oh, oh, oh. I knew the ChatGPT question was coming. Um, and uh, ChatGPT is cool. Uh, it's interesting and it's limited. Um, and I think ChatGPT will reinforce the notion that this has to be a practice of reasoning. That, that, that what we're doing is learning how to reason about the world because chat GPT is only as good as the, the data that it trains on and your ability to ask questions of it. Um, and uh, it seems really, really amazing at first, but so did a lot of data science. And then we learn the limits of it as well as learning the limits of our own craft by being able to think about how we reason with something inductively or deductively, how we structure our data. Uh, those things are they're they just the constraints from the universe. <laughs> they're not the you know there's not many other ways we were able to think about this stuff. Uh, I mean, you know, it, when the universe gets really, really, really small, really, really, really big, some of that stuff gets a bit funny when we talk about quantum entanglement or about uh, you know special relativity. But we're not working at those scales. <laughs> we're we're working at scales where um, where the sort of reasoning of induction and deduction and stable concepts makes a lot of sense. So then using ChatGPT to help refine our tools seems entirely on the table, but, but it's not going to give us some intuition about the world that we, that we wouldn't already know how to, how to take on. Uh, it's not going to um, help us critically appraise the world any better unless we start looking, how can I critically appraise the world better? Um, it is just a tool. In, in that regard, a very powerful one and a harbinger of what's to come. But what's to come should then be greater understanding of reasoning and using it for that practice. Um, anyway, that's it. And I think we're about at time. We got people scooting away. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I mean, I'll be around for the next little bit. I'm happy to take a, a Q&A personally, but I'd really just like to give people time to get to the next thing at three. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much. And we will arrive. Well, I'm not quite